Welcome to the Local Analog Podcast. Today, we are talking with Greg Fennell. For the last year, Greg's work has consistently topped the list as one of my favorite photographers out there today. Greg's work consists of reportage, travel, and editorial projects. He's worked with clients all around the globe and has seen a lot of the world through a viewfinder of a camera. When we finally got time zones worked out, we sat down and discussed the importance of contentment and finding genuine moments within our photos. He even brings some cameras along for some show and tell for those of you watching online. Enjoy the conversation and bring a pen and paper for this one. It's that good. Greg? So Greg, man, how's it going? Yeah, not bad. Not bad, man. Um, so where, where are you right now? I've been asking people where you're at because it's probably not where you're normally at. So I'm at home uh, in South London. Um, I'm about, I guess, if you were to pick kind of uh, Oxford Circus, that's what a lot of kind of people know, or the West End in London. I'm about 10 miles south of that. Nice. And you are in your, what appears to be your home office. Yes, I I'm love, in my. I love the basically. military cases behind you. They're sick. <laughs> I'm basically <laughs> in my gear room. Um, yeah, this is kind of like the box office at home. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I'm one of those people. I have to be careful, otherwise I spread. So I, I got, um, I've literally just re put my our spare room back to a spare room because I turned yeah. it into the mini YouTube studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <that's> awesome. <laughs> over, over the last week, and actually, yeah. it's now got um. My wife's using it for work, but I'm, I've also got, um, a film scanning set up in the corner now. Nice. Nice. So, so I've had is... to decamp basically from my studio, which is a bit further into town. Yeah. And, um, it's about 20 minutes from where I live, but, um, I've not been going into the studio. So I've moved most of my kit back home. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've only ever worked from home. And so I've always kind of had like one section of the house that is just like, you don't let your friends go in. You well, now I'm here. Now I'm here, I'm quite enjoying it, but I also, yeah. I'm looking at stuff going, you know what, this, I could make this a bit more efficient. This desk setup could be better. This is going to be better. Yeah. Um, I worked from home for seven years, but this was in a previous place. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was living in a flat, you know, and I had, there wasn't much communal space and it was basically like a corner of my bedroom. And that was what I had for seven years. And then I got a studio about seven years ago, six years ago. And... I share it with six other photographers, but throughout that stage, it's kind of maybe one of them has been constant. The others have kind of fluctuated. People have come and gone. Yeah. And um, I find it difficult now to revert back because even though I don't shoot a huge amount in the studio, actually having a space to go and work from is, uh, it means I treat it much more like a nine to five. Right. And it also means it, one of the biggest things it kind of taught me was actually being able to turn around to clients Mm -hmm. who were kind of going, you know, they'd had your low res for two, three weeks, and then suddenly they kind of get back in touch on a five o'clock on a Friday kind of afternoon. And they're saying, yeah, actually, we, we really want the high res, um, like first thing on Monday. Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm about to go home. I'm about to leave the office. Yeah, and in their head, yeah. it's like, but don't you work weekends? And you're like, well, yeah, if you're going to pay me overtime. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, uh, so That's it true. kind of made me get a bit more disciplined with how <coughs> I behaved with clients um, and that element of kind of clients having a bit more respect for your boundaries. Because yeah. I think work-life boundaries are a real uh, challenge for a lot of self-employed people, so just, yeah. you know, especially photographers. Um, it can become difficult to know when to kind of close the door right? shut the laptop, so to speak. You know, right. turn the so computer is off. your wife kind of in a creative field as well? My wife's a school teacher. Right on, right on. So is mine. Or she, yeah. she, uh, she stays at home now with our two children. But uh, she, she is a school teacher for a while, and she's planning to go back and doing it. You know, once our kids get a little older. But um, yeah. So my wife is a secondary school teacher here in London, and she um, is obviously currently having to teach from home. So she has to do online lessons for the kids, and yeah. do lesson planning and lesson marking and all that stuff, but just from home. Yeah, uh, you you might hear the sirens. Excuse the sirens. It's noon where I am, and the first day of the month, and where we That's are, they they do the siren test. So 
Oh, Great. right. Okay. Sorry. I thought you yeah. meant like uh, emergency services kind of sirens. That's oh, cool. no. Yeah. So there's actually an impending tornado outside. And we're just going to record through it. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm joking. We've got the, <laughs> I, I do have the, uh, the um, uninterrupted power supply thing. So if it does go dead, it'll stay on for a second. <laughs> and in about an hour, we're done. So uh, we'll cool. talk more about boundaries. Like how, so you're saying like having a studio has actually helped you not so much uh, not at the, not only with doing work in the studio, but also having boundaries with clients. Do you feel like clients are pretty understanding of that? I think they are, but I think there sometimes it takes a little bit of understanding of your situation. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, I've been doing it for a while now. I, one thing I kind of realized, you know, a few years in was that you kind of have to be stand up for yourself and put those boundaries in place. But also the great thing about being freelance is if you work with clients who are, don't understand that and don't respect that, it's your yeah. choice whether or not you continue to work with them. Right. Exactly. Um, and obviously some people get stressed because they think, oh, but the next person will bend over backwards for them. And it's just like, that's well, fine. If they want to do that, it's up to them. Yeah. But, um, and it's not to say I wouldn't, I don't kind of work hard on those with those clients. It's just that there has to be a kind of mutual respect. You know, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. there's certain ways I wouldn't ever dare treat one of my clients. And I kind of right. expect that in, you know, back. Right. Um, and for me, I also think that generally, if you're going to survive in this game uh, and avoid burnout, you need to kind of have those boundaries in place um, to be able to just, know when to step back because i've seen colleagues that have you know destroyed their relationships or destroyed friendships or just literally got to their wits end because they're working every hour that god sends their way and it's kind of like yeah. uh it's not sustainable right and then ultimately if you want to survive in the photography industry it's you know as everyone always says it's a marathon not a race it's not a sprint right Right. So what's been, what's kind of been your background? So like, a, I love learning about um, photographers, especially, you know, you've been doing it for more than a decade, like 13 mm -hmm. years. What is kind of like your, your background? Like has, has it always kind of been, you know, visual arts? Has it always been a lot of photographers come from music, come from graphic design? You know, there's always something that kind of is the liaison between what you were doing and photography. Um, what was it so for you? I mean, I've only ever done photography. Yeah, that's that's basically been me. I um, although saying that, I didn't study it. So, my original interest was kind of in in art and painting and drawing. Um, you know, at school, I was kind of, I was the grade A student for art. You know, like that was my domain, and yeah, um, every free period I had, I would be in the art department. And I kind of, I don't know if you go, how it would relate, but when you're kind of like 16, 17, you, you have your A-levels in, in the UK. Yeah. And um, around that period, I discovered photography because there was a dark room at school that was never used. And one of my modules, I started looking into it. They didn't teach it, but I kind of uh, taught myself with a friend of mine how to use the dark room and then kind of fell in love with it really and started shooting and printing and then suddenly I switched from spending all my spare time in the art department painting to spending all my time in in the dark room and I mean for me I had a I had a weekend job at the time I had a couple of different weekend jobs but one of my jobs was um working in a the like the town library and i um, I mean it's a bit of a cliche but I I basically stumbled across a book by Don McCullen um you know big photography book all his kind of black and white pictures from Vietnam, Lebanon, um, all across Africa and Cyprus. And, you know, the guy basically was the war photographer in the UK, he used to work a lot for the Sunday Times. And um, I guess I was really surprised because I was really interested, uh, aside from art, I was really interested in history and seeing this photo book with all these images from these different periods of history was just so mind boggling yeah. and amazing to me because there was this person that had literally been there witnessing it, but not only witnessing it, he'd been able to uh, communicate that visually. And in a way that kind of I realized was emotionally like it was 
I was looking at these images and being drawn in emotionally. And for me, that was um, really powerful. And immediately yeah. I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And um, so I went off to university. I studied history and war studies at university uh, in London. And then I'm not from London originally. I, I grew up down on the South Coast. So coming to London was, you know, was a, at the time was kind of a big deal. It was like moving to the big city. Um, and I continued to kind of follow my interest in photography. And I started shooting for the student newspaper and started shooting for a few small magazines. And then when I graduated, I was meant to be going to do some work in the West Bank in um, uh, at a university called Berzeit University. And just before we were due to go, the Israel Hezbollah war broke out. Hmm. So this was 2006. And um, the mate who I was going with, who was a writer, we kind of talked about it and we decided we'd had our tickets. We might as well go anyway. So we, so we bought some flat jackets on eBay and we basically went out and instead of going and doing the workshop, we went and covered the war. Hmm. Um, I ended up spending about a month out there covering what we could from the Israeli side, which, you know, was a lot safer than being in Lebanon. Yeah. You know, you're not, it was a different type of war because on the Israeli side, there was a lot of Katusha rockets landing. But if you'd been in Lebanon, you know, you risked being blown to pieces by an Israeli fast jet before you'd right. even realized what was happening, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was interesting. I was there kind of covering that and I met a, an American photographer who used to shoot, I think, for at the time, I think he was with AP, called John Moore. He's um, he's still around. He's won all sorts of press awards over the years, an amazing photographer and a really nice guy. He basically took me under his wing on a few kind of little um, kind of missions that he was doing and allowed me to kind of ride shotgun with him. And yeah it was amazing because I kind of learned so much just from watching him work basically. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that many situations that we went into together, but it had a profound effect on me. Um, and he was generous enough to kind of take on this, you know, this 21 year old kid or however old I was yeah. back then. Uh, I think, with... I think that's interesting. So like the idea of like apprenticeship, you know, like, is such is such a lost thing. Um, yeah, but this know. was kind of like an apprenticeship forged in the middle of chaos. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. when I say apprenticeship, it was very short lived and fleeting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for him, he would probably find it difficult to even remember. Yeah. But for me, it, you know, and that's the thing. It, <laughs> sometimes these things happen in your life, and they affect you far more than the other person, probably. Oh, but it totally. was. Um, so I kind of I went from there to go back to London and I um, I realized that I was really kind of gripped by what I was doing, but it also, I wasn't 100% sure I could do that particular type of work. I was fascinated by history. I was fascinated by um, conflict and what have you, but at the same time I was repulsed by it and I didn't really want to be chasing it as a photographer. Um, but it took me a few years to realize that. Um, I went on after that and um, covered the independence movement in Kosovo in about 2008 and I kind of traveled to Syria and Lebanon 2007 I spent a lot of time kind of traveling and trying to kind of um figure things out basically yeah um, yeah it's, it's interesting um you know you've been you kind of came about before the age of like Instagram and Mm. social media and you know for someone like me i'm i'm 26 i'm about to be 27 and uh someone like me i became a photographer because of instagram mm. be because of like seeing pictures and seeing things that were inspiring like i've i've seen photo books my whole life but never felt pulled or grabbed by them and of course you know i didn't see a, a robert frank book when i was 14 or you know, I didn't see these books that I'm seeing now, but, but, but it, it's interesting to think about the effects, I guess, Instagram and social media have had on the amount of photographers that there are today mm. for better, for better or for worse. I mean, yeah. honestly, yeah, cause, yeah, yeah. cause, cause some people are, 
Um, I mean, you, you, you see the whole gamut. I mean, you see, you see people who are truly talented that are underrated and you see people who are not talented, who are overrated. I mean, you, you see that, the, you know, social media kind of has an ugly side of it and a, and a, a great side of it. Yeah. Um, I owe a lot of the fact that I'm able to pay bills because of clients finding me on social media or Google or whatever. And so I'm thankful for it, but it's interesting having probably launched your career without any of that stuff. Um, yeah. And for me, the kind of what I miss, I guess now is, I mean, this is not going about that long, but when I was traveling back then, you weren't always connected quite often. You didn't have to get internet. You'd still have to go to an internet cafe. It wasn't like you'd just pick up Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, and when I first started traveling, I certainly didn't have a smartphone and that was great because in a way, like now when I travel, I never really feel like I'm traveling. I'm still connected. I'm still mm -hmm. switched into it all and plugged in. And the great thing about not having that is you're actually, when you, when you are plugged in, you're not really paying attention because yeah. you've, you've still got one foot back in the safety of the, if that kind of digital world. But if you don't have that, if you can travel in a place where you have no comms and you have no way of connecting, it forces you to really engage with the situation. It also gives you space mentally to think about what you're doing and to think about your experiences. And I mean, some people are disciplined enough to still be able to do that, to keep journals and what have you. But I used to love being able to do all that when I was first traveling, you know, to actually yeah. really um, immerse myself in a situation or a place that I was in. Um, yeah but it's kind of becoming rarer and rarer. And I think in a way that's sad because it is nice to be able to fully engage rather than to have that kind of, you know, you, it's that, it's that funny thing, you know, you might be somewhere and you nowadays there's nothing much going on, but you could sit in your hotel room or your hostel or whatever and get on your phone and connect in yeah. inverted commas back to the kind of world, you know, whereas back then if you didn't, if you didn't kind of have anything to do or you, you would make yourself, you'd go out, you'd force yourself to go talk to strangers. You'd, you'd maybe write or read or do something rather than just the same thing that you might do if you were sat on the sofa at home, there's yeah. suddenly no difference. Like, and that's the thing, like if you can go onto Instagram and scroll uh, in my living room, but I can also do that if I'm, you know, in Rio de Janeiro or if I'm in Aleppo or whatever, then it suddenly it 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 forces it stops you from kind of fully grounding yourself in that location if that makes any yeah. sense yeah and and honestly like i feel like that issue that you just pointed out is kind of uh indicative of um kind of just the the the, the world at large you know like we're not good at connecting anymore and if you're at the post office and a stranger starts talking to you um it, it kind of catches you off guard, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, whereas 15, 20 years ago, that probably would not have been the case. It's just what you did. If you didn't talk to a stranger, you know, and there was nobody else around, there's no, there's no other option. <laughs> well, I guess and, um, now we talk to, I mean, the, the flip side of that is now we talk to strangers online. Exactly. That's exactly what we've done. <laughs> you exactly. know, like we're total strangers and, and it's, and, and that's where it's good because it's like, you know, I'm not in the South of London. Like I would have never crossed paths probably any other yeah. way. And so that's how it is good. But I think, you know, it's especially the flip as, side to every coin, you know, like. absolutely. And as a photographer, you know, you want to be able to be present and, um, you know, not live vicariously through everyone else that you're scrolling and you're seeing. And, uh, cause then you get all sorts of issues of discontentment and. Oh, big time. I you mean, know, I would anxiety. find it. I think it's hard because, I mean, when I was starting out, I mean, the web blogs and stuff I, were really kind of web 1.0, 2.0 kind of early days. So, yeah. you know, I used to keep, I still do keep a blog, but I'm like, who the hell reads a blog anymore? Like yeah. it, it's yeah. so, um, it seems so odd. And yet I used to love doing it when I was doing it in writing and just feeling like I had, was you know, you felt like you were publishing your own thing. Whereas now I guess you would put a video up or do Instagram and, that's fine. That's great in its own way. But um, I do miss that somewhat. And I do feel like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just 
it is what it is, isn't it? I mean, technology yeah. constantly changes the way that we absorb and, and um, kind of chew through imagery is different. I feel like what, to pick up on what you were saying, that whole kind of discontentment thing, I think that would be a killer for me. Um, it is difficult when you're looking through. And I found that with what's going on now, you know, like with the yeah. COVID-19. And um, I y'all found... Have, y'all have that over there? <laughs> I'm joking. I found it's difficult to like look at social media and see people doing these kind of personal projects and being productive. And I know, I know personally, know photographers who have really struggled because yeah. they felt this kind of like pressure of in times like this of all times. Yeah, the times when you've got the perfect excuse to sit at home and do nothing because you're basically yeah. being told by the government don't you leave can. your house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> people are feeling pressure that they need to be producing something or they need to be creative, you know? Yeah. And actually, um, I, I kind of think it's interesting because it's highlighting just how unsustainable this kind of constant consumption, this constant need to be producing stuff. It, it's not necessary. It's not, it really isn't mm-hmm. necessary, but the point is on social media is that everybody's pushing out that they're having such a great time that they're being so productive and they're doing this. And it's such a, it's such a a limited view of reality it's such a yeah Yeah. and i i I mean i've i don't know obviously i don't know how old your kids are but uh, i don't have kids yet um i'd love to one day but i always worry about kind of the world that they're coming into in terms of those external pressures and i mean i guess we had different ones when we were growing up but yeah yeah it's it's a it's a you know it's a byproduct of you know, everything's about consumerism. Everything's about, um, you know, like even as a photographer, I can fall into that of like always thinking that I need a new piece of gear. And it's, it oh, really 100%. is, yeah. it really is like a real sense of anxiety. It's like, oh, like I've got to have that. Um, and it's like, there's not really one good reason why I should have that. I think would... photography is really guilty. I mean, I can't speak for other things, but I think photography is really guilty for that because yeah. How many times have you looked at something and gone, oh, if only you had that bag, I'd be more yeah. like that person. If only right. I had that camera, I'd shoot more like this. If only I had that. And we all do it. Um, I'm yeah. totally going to hold my hands up and say, I've, I, yeah. I I see myself doing that at times being like, oh, but if I had that bit of kit, it would, it would change things maybe. Yeah. And it, it's not obviously, but it's, it's interesting. Not- like, uh, I feel like, I feel like a lot of times we want shortcuts. Like we want to look like, this photographer, like I'll, like I, I go and watch your, you know, lighting video that you just put out, which is excellent by the way. Um, and it's like, I can't stop thinking. It's like, I've got a think tank, think tank bag, but man, what if I had one like Greg's, then I could go and do this, this and that. But it's like, why in the world do I think that me getting this bag is really going to change anything other than like the way I'm, I'm, uh, perceived. Mm. And, and we have this, we have this, um, I think one of the biggest problems is we want to be perceived a certain way without doing the work that it takes to actually become that person. And so yeah. we're, we're more, we're more content with, you know, looking a certain way than doing the work. But yeah, uh, it's or, just, as you said, it's a shortcut. We want to buy, we want to buy our way forward. It's like you play in a computer game and you, you know, it's like, it's basically what they do with kids now and they sit on their phones or their iPads and it's like, you could play all these levels and take all this time to get there, or you could just pay and and skip them all and get a bonus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's so kind of, it's that gambling addictive nature that our brains are hardwired to kind of um, respond to. Um, But equally on the flip side of that, there has, there have been studies that people actually perform better when they are, um, dressed for the occasion for example Mm. so there's been studies in terms of i can't remember what the actual term for it is but basically if you went for a job interview and you dress incredibly you know smartly and you dress maybe slightly differently than the way you would it elevates the way that you think about yourself and i do wonder if there is an element to that in terms of you know you have a certain camera that's associated with this or you have a certain piece of kit it might make you think i mean we all have old film cameras right. and some of those you know you it does change the way you work and it also yeah. changes the way that people perceive you and that in turn changes the way changes the type of images you get because Absolutely. You know, if, you, if you go out on the street and you're taking a, a portrait with a twin lens Rolifex, 
people are possibly going to give you more time than if you were there with a little Sony RX 100, whatever. Like it's right, right. And you're snapping away like crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a friend who uh, just he took a new job. He lost his job. This is probably two years ago. He lost his job and he needed a new one. It I, I I was leaving the job that I was in and I was doing video production for a marketing agency. And um, I don't recommend working for a marketing agency. Um, but I was doing this video production job and I was leaving the job and I said, hey, you should totally apply for it. You've got some experience with it. And uh, he went in there and uh, my old boss was like, was like, um, and I hope he never listens to this, but he, my old boss was like, Hey, so are you like pretty familiar with the Adobe suite, After Effects, Premiere Pro, um, you know, Photoshop. And my friend was just like, yep. And had never worked in these things before. And, um, he went home for the next two nights while he was waiting, like the verdict, if he got the job and he learned, he taught himself everything. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's kind of like that fake it till you make it kind of thing. It's like, mm. you kind of just like, I mean, and, and that's kind of being like dishonest. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend being dishonest if you're going to get a job. But um, in his position, he was like, he like could do it. And so yeah. it, it was like one of those things to where he was just like, yeah, I mean, or he was just teachable. He was like, I'll learn it. Like, I just need a job. I well, have the passion. I just, yeah. I'll, I'll learn it. So. It's interesting. Like the, the guy that uh, I interviewed yesterday, actually for our podcast, um, Chris, he, uh, he's been shooting for like 27 years. And he was saying a similar story about how when he first started assisting, you know, the photographer was like, you know, do you know how to dev films? Blah, 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 blah. And Chris had worked with kind of plastic spools. He'd not worked with metal spools and he just assumed they were the same. And it's a similar thing. Like it's like a bit of software, but this was hardware. He went in and he screwed it up on the first day. Yeah. Uh, and the photographer was obviously really aware, like you can't, you can't yeah. do what you said you could do. Yeah. But he kind of, he let him stay on and eventually let him go. But it, yeah, people have done that for generations. You know, that um, I'm probably too honest for my own good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at kind of um, saying I, I can do something when I can't. But generally, like your friend, you know, if, if I need to, I just find a way and just figure it out. Well, it's kind of one of those things to where, you know, I had a job a few few months ago to where I was going to be at this gala and I was supposed to be photographing, you know, 10 to 15 people at a time on a backdrop. And and this is how this gets you in trouble because I wouldn't kind of label this as dishonesty because you just assume you can. You've never done it before. You just assume it's a bad assumption, essentially, and um, can get you in a lot of trouble. But uh, so I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can shoot, you know, groups of people on a backdrop with my you know, with my single Octobox and maybe a fill light or something. And man, we get there. And first of all, they were wrong because it's more like 20, 25 people. And yeah. I have I have a 12 foot backdrop uh, yeah. lengthwise. And 12 feet is really like, as far as full body, you really can't put more than like four or five people, maybe six. And we're, we're in Mississippi. Mississippi is the most obese state <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the country. And so we're talking about like, you know, in some cases, like two people could be more like three or four people, <laughs> which I, I mean, that sounds really mean, but that's just how, you know, it's, it's kind of the reality there. But uh, so, yeah, man, like pretty much I had to Photoshop everything. Like I had to Photoshop. Yeah. I just had to shoot them from really far away. And I had to Photoshop people's, the backdrop behind people. And it was just like, it was like a lesson for me. And like, Oh, being 100%. very, being I mean, very I, upfront of like, Hey, I don't know if this will work. You might have to yeah. buy a bigger backdrop. Yeah. You know? and, and the, to, you know, the only way you actually learn these things is by making the mistake yourself. Yeah. And there are no successes without all of those mistakes that have got you to that place. Yeah. So never kind of shy away from those things or be embarrassed about them because we've all done them and we've all been in those situations where you're gone like, damn, uh, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take something away from this. I mean, I used to keep a book, like a little notebook in my camera bag. And every time I went on a job and screwed something up, I would, I would be like, put another point, like point 53. Yeah. Always make sure, you know, like, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of like, I, I just had to do that because I never assisted. So for me, yeah. there was never anyone to kind of learn those mistakes from. I had to kind of go out there and make my own mistakes. Yeah, I've I've never assisted either. I did assist a uh, photographer one time, and uh, he was one of the few photographers who shot. He shoots commercial jobs only on film, 
and I was, I was assisting him. And so I was loading his like contact six, four, five and his, uh, his roller flex. And, um, and, and like, I've been shooting medium format for, uh, you know, three or four years. And so like, I'm, I'm good with the, the you know, the, the loading mechanisms, but man, like I was just nervous that day. And dude, I was dropping his rolls left and right, like shot rolls. And I was just like, I, I like freaked him out, man. Cause he was like, this dude's about to like cost me this entire job. And, uh, and so it's like, for me, it's like, I took a huge note in my head of like, don't drop film. <laughs> like don't yeah. sit down. And if you have to just don't drop the film and uh, yeah, I mean, you learn and it's like, I've really envied people who have gotten started with a, um, with having like a, somebody to learn from. Uh, mm. I really envy the, those kinds of people. And, and I, and I fear that a lot of that's kind of behind us, you know, like some of my favorite, you know, hospitality photographers, they're, you know, they're in their fifties, you know, and like, they're talking about, they, they actually took over, they another photographer's business at some point that they were apprenticing for. Um, but, but speaking of technology, I'm kind of curious. So I know that, um, uh, you shoot with several different, uh, co- uh camera companies. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to get into how that's a creative decision for you and not, maybe not just creative, but it's probably also logistical. Yeah. Um, it's mainly practical. Yeah. 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 So I'm kind of curious. So you shoot with uh, Fuji, Canon and, and Leica. Yeah, and uh, I'm, and maybe more, uh, especially as you talk about maybe the role of flex or something. But I'm kind of curious to know, you know, what what dictates those decisions and um, how that's you know, because most people are like a one company kind of person. Yeah. So with you shooting three different companies, how does that help you? It's pretty simple um, for me. Shooting with, I tend to, I mean, I've traditionally have always shot with Canon, and I started shooting with Fuji when they started bringing out the, I think. The first one I got of theirs was probably the X100, yeah, the original one. And I've really loved the X series cameras, but I still so basically the way I split it is anything where I'm shooting with flash, I shoot with my Canon still. Yeah. And anything that's more kind of travel related or photojournalistic y related, I've started shooting with the Fujis. Hmm. And partly that is a weight issue. Um, yeah. I've suffered kind of back issues in the last kind of five years, I guess. And a lot of that's from kind of wearing a, a shoulder bag on one shoulder and, you know, lugging camera gear through numerous airports and what have you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I have travel assignments, I now tend to favor the Fujis just because they're lighter, they're smaller. I have the X pro two and I have the XT threes. Obviously I can change the lenses between the two of them but at the same time kind of have a slightly different way of shooting. Yeah. Um, I love the X100. I haven't got the V yet, the latest one, but I probably will be getting that. I I had had the, the, the most recent, uh, addition of that camera. Uh, the, I guess the four F F F sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I had that camera and you know, for me, it was just, I couldn't stand how I'm such a depth of field maniac. I still got it here. That looks so sick. That's a, I'm, I'm such a depth of field maniac and I, I got so frustrated when I would like go out and like, I just love shooting wide open. Uh, yeah. it's, it's pro- like, and I've learned with Leica, you really shouldn't do that with their 35 millimeter lenses. Things look way better. Stop down a good bit, but, and I would just go out like to the woods and take photos like F2 or F2.8, whatever it goes down to and just, uh, being like, Oh, you know, these images, but you know, some of my favorite photographers use those cameras and they've, I've, and I've owned the X-T2. I've had a, a, I had like a three month journey with Fuji. Yeah. Um, I, it took me a while to kind of get on board with the, cause I moved from Adobe Lightroom to capture for processing. Yeah. And I, so the way I work is I will, or the way I used to work was I would have a catalog for a Lightroom catalog for each year. And then within that catalog, I would have my kind of, jobs divided up by genre so editorial jobs commercial jobs travel jobs and then within that would have clients and then within that would be the month um yeah yeah the month day and the job um and so i didn't want to move my system from shooting in lightroom to capture until i at the end of a year so i gave myself like a kind of four month transitional period where i started kind of getting more familiar with capture but moving across obviously i lost a lot of my development presets and the stuff that i'd worked a long time to kind of create 
and I kind of had to start from scratch. And I, I had a friend who, uh, another photographer who, um, he came into the studio and we shot a color chart on all of my cameras. We then shot them on medium format, uh, Kodak portrait. He then hand printed, um, the portrait, um, print and basically created profiles based on that print for me wow. for all my cameras and it's kind of it's taken a while basically to tweak the fujis to a place where i'm in i'm excited by the 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 way i can process the files because when i was processing them in lightroom i just i was never that happy with what i was getting yes yeah. um and so <clears throat> even now i'm still and i i go through that with my leica you know i find the leica files a bit of a pain in the ass to work with if i'm honest yeah um yeah. and that's kind of what's kept me on with canon because i'm more familiar with canon files because i've shot with yeah. them for yeah. 13 years whatever so i i um yeah i i can i can easily get where i want to be with a canon file where i take it takes a bit longer with yeah. the other cameras but that it's basically is my setup so the, the the leica stuff i tend to i have an m10 um and uh, an m10p and i have an what, m6 as well what, what think... lens is that on there that's uh that's a 50 f2 nice yeah simacron that's beautiful man that's a beautiful that's a beautiful specimen <laughs> it's uh it's nice yeah it's i took this i had a job just before lockdown actually when was it like february march in kenya yeah uh, on safari it was a travel assignment job and I took this and the Fujis and I actually shot a lot just on the Leicas, which shooting Safari stuff on a Leica with a 50 mil lens is not what most people would do, but yeah. I quite like the limitations that it forces yeah, on yeah. you and that, ha and you know what that means for, for creativity. I mean, the actual job was a, a walking Safari. Anyway, we spent four days walking across the Mara, um, uh, the Northern conservancies in the, in the, in the Mara triangle or near the Mara triangle. So I had to carry all my kit and, um, I mean, the like is just a, just a bit of a beast, but yeah, yeah, it does have a lot of little issues that piss me off. Yeah. Yeah. Especially considering how expensive that camera is. Yeah. Do you, in my issues, do you, do you typically mean post-processing because those kinds of images? Sorry, do I? So you mean like issues with like the post production side of things, or do you think partly that, that, partly with the, the with the way it works as a camera? Sometimes it's just little glitches here and there that yeah. you just think for a camera that's that expensive, you think why haven't they ironed this out? And the yeah. thing I love about Fuji, uh, Fuji Film have this kind of you know that Kaizen mentality where they're always getting one percent better, but they also have this thing you know the, the fact that they'll bring out a firmware update for a camera that's ten months old. And they've already superseded that camera, but yet they're yeah. still bringing out a firmware update for their older cameras. Yeah, yeah. Canon don't really do that. Right. Uh, I don't think you know, most camera brands do that. And for me, that's like a sign of respect from Fuji to their people that use their kit. And I massively appreciate that. Yeah. And I massively kind of respect that as a as a decision that they've made. Yeah, I've they considered... Don't need to do it. Yeah, you're right. And, and a lot of my work has actually shifted away from needing a, um, I guess like a, just a full frame sensor camera that can be shot really fast. Like I just, I don't really, I, I've kind of, I'm kind of moving away from shooting a lot of those types of event things. And I've actually considered moving and trying one of the new GFX from Fuji. And I've just like, I've heard incredible things. Um, about them by like photographers that I think shoot in a similar kind of approach as me, mm. um, coming from like a medium format, like, like I'm shooting medium format more than I'm shooting really anything, especially as it regards to like personal work. Yeah. And so, uh, and like having like some sort of uh, proximity to a medium format feel, I think would be really, would be a really unique kind of situation for me. And so, I, you know, we're, we're talking about a $5,000 body, plus the lenses. And so it would, it would be, you know, a long time before I could actually justify it. I'm on Sony right now. And I feel like it gives me like good enough results. I'm not, I'm not like wanting anything. I'm just, um, yeah. You're always wondering, you know, if it could I shot with you. the GFX, 
uh, on a job in the Philippines uh, about two years ago. Um, we went to, it was, it was an NGO job, so we were working in uh, near Marawi, where, the, where they were fighting IS. Yeah. Um, uh, there was like a big insurrection in Mindanao. And um, so we were, we were working a lot in kind of situations and working in um, uh, IDP camps and what have you. And I was shooting predominantly portraits with that and then some more reportage with my smaller Fujis. And I found the GFX, the files are amazing, but I found it frustrating at the time because of using it with flash yeah, inside. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just find it difficult working with electronic viewfinders and flash. I don't know why. I I mean, they've come so far and yet I still find it deeply frustrating and unrewarding. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed uh, from like a lot of like on your website and things you have, you kind of have this, um, you have this really unique approach to the way you capture things. And I can always, you know, and, and, and I really do mean this. I can always tell when it's a Greg Fennell image, by the way it's composed and by the way it's colored. You have a very unique look to your photos. And uh, I think that was one of the things that really drew me to your work. And, um, you know, I started following you right around the time you posted the images of Chris Hemsworth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that was right around that. It was about a year ago, maybe. Yeah. And, um, and then I, I, I turned my friend uh, I told my friend Thomas, who was actually on the podcast uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was like, "Dude, you got to check out this guy's work." Uh, you know, the shots of you uh, uh, photographing—I guess it was the uh, um, the bull was it bullfighters? That literally, there's a—I'll uh, I'll link this in the show notes. But there's literally this image of a uh, a man with a horse or like a donkey, like upside down, and he's holding the legs of the horse. Oh, I just, see, yeah. It's this portrait of him, and it's just like, it's unbelievable. And I, I love those types of images. And um, I'm kind of curious to know, like, how do you how do you describe that? Like, how do you describe your, your approach? And you can go as deep as you want on this. Like, what's your approach to, like, um, if, you, if you get an email and from four different companies or four different organizations and they say we want an editorial job here we want a reportage job here we Mm. want a travel job here do you approach all three of those similarly with different logistics or do you approach them all completely different based on what they are i think it's partly based on who they are and what they are um i you know you have to kind of know your audience but equally I tend to, depending on how well I know the art directors as well and how well they know me, and, you know, because some art directors will just want me to kind of do my thing and then some art directors will kind of have a very prescribed box that you need to fit in. Right. Um, So it depends a lot on that. It depends on where I am in my mindset, you know, what else is going on. Um, And also really i mean fundamentally editorial for me is a way it's access it's a way into a story you know it's um i shot a a story before at the end of last year before christmas in it was out in uh brazil and we were photographing um like transgender stars of carnival and it was fascinating um and an amazing story really difficult logistically and lots of stuff didn't work out the way I would have liked it to have worked out. But my approach to it was so different to the way I would approach other stuff. And maybe it isn't, maybe people would look at it and still think it's kind of, you know, it's it's, it's got my kind of vibe, my, my style on it. But my, my approach is very much based on the feeling that I had when I was there at these kind of Samba schools I need, I kind of, I, I want to be able to be open to react to stuff and to yeah. be reactive. I think maybe that's what you're trying me to, you know, to get me to kind of look into. But for me, it's kind of, I find I'm a better photographer when I'm reacting to something rather than going in with too much of a preconceived notion of how I want to portray it. Yeah. It's a bit of both, but ultimately, you know, this is why, I mean, I, and obviously I, I shoot, still life i shoot food and stuff for travel clients but i much prefer live action i much prefer 
being yeah. in a situation where I'm reacting to stuff and being an observer, being a fly on the wall. You know, right. for me, that was my way into photography. It was documentary photography. And I had incredibly strong kind of, um, or should I say like more rigid kind of ethical constraints on that yeah. in terms of how much you get involved in what you're shooting. And of course, from the commercial point of view, that all goes out the window. And I remember, I think I was on a job in Guatemala and was working alongside a video guy who was also there for a, the NGO I was working with doing the video side of things and realizing how much, and maybe this sounds naive, but I wasn't, it was such an eye opener to see somebody doing video and, and realizing how much they had to compromise and just make, not make stuff up, but create situations everywhere. And with photography, I'd always seen that as a total no, no, Right. You know, because in documentary and reportage, you just can't do that. You can't go in and start rearranging stuff. You can't start telling people what to do and then start shooting it as if you've just discovered it. And there are people that do that. I mean, I've seen documentary photographers do that in the field and I never wanted to be like that. I never wanted to be that person. So for me, even though now I do more commercial work and maybe the the rules are less strict, um, I still feel like I personally prefer being as authentic as possible in those situations yeah. and it is kind of what I get hired for now like a lot of the time when I show my portfolio to clients and to prospective clients and art directors who work in the commercial world who are fully expecting everything to be set up they say stuff like really like your work because it feels really authentic and I'm like you know why it feels authentic because it is Mm -hmm. <laughs> i yeah. didn't set that up like that happened yeah. Yeah. and sometimes they won't believe that and sometimes that's not what they want to hear because ultimately with commercial they want to see that you can set something up and make it look authentic and obviously that's something i've had to learn to do for those clients and in those situations be able to try and create genuinely realistic looking things and situations rather than something that looks total cheese balls which you can see a mile off in the commercial world. I mean, yeah. you see it everywhere, don't you? But yeah. also with the commercial world, so much of it's out of your hands. You do the shoot and you kind of really happy with some element of what you got and they go with something that's so left field and totally different. But that's that's yeah. their choice. They're the client. So Yeah, we, we've you know talked about on this podcast before of like how you will, you will go through all of this work and travail to you know do what the client wants you to do. And especially with larger clients, I've noticed that there's more uh, there's more likelihood that they're not going to use these photos at all. You know, if you're talking with a if you're talking with like a smaller client that has a lower budget, they need photos. They're going to use every picture you give them. Mm. But uh, if you're talking about these larger companies, you, know, you just you just have no idea kind of what they're going to do with your images and how they're going to use them. Um, man, to talk to me, talk to me a little bit about. Um, your journey with film. So local analog obviously is a film centric mm. YouTube channel, but this podcast has kind of allowed me to talk more in detail about the philosophies of photography of life that I think are valuable, but I'm kind of curious to know. Uh, and that was one, another thing that really drew me to you was, you know, seeing that you were shooting with a little bit of film with some projects. And I'm assuming you do a lot of film with personal projects too, and travel. Um, mm. But uh, I'm not as much curious. as I used to, really? um, okay. but that's partly because I found that I was getting too distracted. It's that classic thing. And I still do it. Sometimes I'll leave the house and I'll be like, oh, I just take my uh, so-and-so camera. And then you're like, oh, but what if I want to shoot? OK, I better take that because it's got black and white film in it. Uh, but, oh, but it might be nice. In a, OK, I'll take the X-Pan. Oh, but what if I want 120? Okay, I'll take the roll. Okay, I'll take the Bronica, you know, which, and then you kind yeah. of, you end up not shooting on any of them. Yeah. yeah. So You're tying your hands. I mean, this is my kind of, this camera is uh, oh, man, yeah. my wide lux. Um, and this is a fantastic camera. This is the one that I still, sorry, that's that's for the podcast listeners. That's, that's the, an amazing uh, noise, man. That's the lens rotating around. Apparently you're meant to massage the lens. <laughs> um so uh, years ago i i sh i've had to photograph jeff bridges um for i think it was when tron not the original obviously but when tron came back out yeah 
and I was sent by one of their film magazines to go photograph him. It was a classic kind of press junket type of thing in a hotel room. And I was quite nervous because obviously photographing the dude. Um, yeah, like the dude, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's an absolute legend. Like he's, he was lovely, such a professional. Just, so, you know, God knows what he thought of me in this weird hotel room they put us in as well. It was like fake Italian villa in the middle of central London. It was awful. But anyway, um, I didn't realize till afterwards, but he's obviously a massive wide luck shooter. He yeah, shoots, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, And I wish I'd known because I, that would have been such a good icebreaker. And it wasn't till yeah. afterwards that someone told me and I went and I saw like the whole section on his website. It's all about the wide lux. And, and I mean, he's a really good shooter. His stuff that he yeah. shot on it is really good. Um, I don't know why I'm so surprised by that. I mean, he's, but yeah, I, it's a tricky camera to use and he, yeah. he's nailed it. Um, yeah. I love so I still take, work on that. I still take his camera. Yeah. You should link to it. If people haven't seen it, definitely link to that. I, um, I, uh, I still take this wide lux with me on most assignments. It pretty much goes around the world with me. It's, it's bruised and battered. I don't really look after my kit that well, just because of the nature of, what I do and and I don't know the stuff the stuff gets you know it's a tool at the end of the day it's it's not right. made to be sat on the shelf um and so I shoot a lot with that but but you were asking me about my journey I guess so I started um when I was still at school so this is like late 90s early 2000s started to kind of get into film photography at school shooting you know with an old SLR developing my own film and then printing my own film. Um, got a digital camera, probably my first digital camera around 2003. Didn't really, I, I think I shot with maybe a little kind of point and shoot film camera, but that was basically all I shot with in terms of film yeah. until about 2010 when I started to get back into it. I started buying a lot of film cameras um, and now I've got, oh, what have I got? I've got like a Mamiya 7. I've got a Ronica SQAI. I've got a Rolly Cord. So they're all 120. I have a whole bunch of Polaroids, mm -hmm. you know, peel apart Polaroid, LAN cameras, yeah. the 600 SE. Um, I've got the SX70, like a lovely old. Yeah. Yeah. I've wanted to get one of those, man. Those are so rare. There we go. That one there, which is still in its leather case i mean those are great little cameras it's beautiful yeah um i've got oh, i've got all sorts so now i've got the leica m6 i've got little olympus xas which were fantastic little point of shoes i've got a contacts t2 i've got the wide lux i have an x-pan um got a couple of slrs still so i've got the whole gamut of cameras yeah and don't really shoot with a lot of them that much anymore. So I do, but I just, I find it difficult. I, f I find it painful to part with them, you know, yeah, and I started to use the lenses on other cameras and that's what's kind of exciting as well. Like being uh, able to yeah. put my Leica glass on a Fuji for if I'm filming or, you know, I've been shooting, doing DSLR scanning on negs and I've got it set up with a Canon um, 5D, uh, what was it? The 5DR? whatever the 40 megapixel one is. Yeah, the big one, yeah. A couple of years old, those were cameras. But I, I've got a Bronica macro lens that I can fit onto that Canon that gets mm. me amazing scans in my necks. So how how do you, do you use film for your commercial stuff? Not really. I mean, I, talking about kind of Kenya, you know, mentioned that assignment. I did take the wide lux and shot a lot on it. But what I'll do is if I will, with commercial work, it's difficult to shoot film alongside digital because it just isn't time. You're there to focus on the job. With ed editorial, I treat as more relaxed because there's very rarely, you know, an art director on set, especially if it's an, if you're on assignment, it's just you and the writer. So there's so much more freedom for me to go off and do what I want. And quite often the clients actually like that because I'll come back with the digital files and I'll be like, Oh, and I also have these if you're interested. And then they're suddenly kind of like looking at a wide lux neg, not understanding what the hell it is and why it <laughs> yeah, yeah. looks the way it looks, you know? So yeah. I do like to be able to 
shoot film when I have the the space, the mental space and the actual time to do it. But I don't do it where I feel like it's going to be a distraction from the actual job in hand. Yeah, that's probably really wise and good for photographers that are younger, like me, for example, to hear. Because a lot of times, like I'll bring along like a Pentax 6.7 to a, a food shoot. And like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to like do something creative and cool. And, and like all it, and, and sometimes like I'm able to do that. But I've also seen in some instances to where it's actually just been more of a distraction. And I could have been getting these moments because I'm, I'm like you, like I really do value like authentic moments that I don't have to create, you know, and you come to a point in a, in a, especially in the commercial hospitality realm to where you have to put two people together, uh, having cocktails in a nice hotel. You have to do that at some point um, because you can't control who these people are. You can't control the environment. And so, and you know, you're not going to go up to random strangers and say, Hey, can I, you can, of course, but in most cases, you know, you're not working with authentic uh, situations. So you have to kind of get people together to be authentic. Yeah. But I feel, but I feel like, um, sometimes like the film can keep me from grabbing those moments. And, you know, it's, it's very telling to see some of like the, the, the heroes and legends of, of photography, like the Annie Leibovitzes and things like that. And if you look at what they're shooting today, they're, they're shooting digital. And there's yeah. a reason there's, there's something to learn from that. Like, I'm sure she might shoot, you know, film, you know, she walks in her town when she's not on a job, but like to, to really value the job and really to value those moments and getting those not those non artificial, those genuine moments. It's not so much about, uh, you know, which tool it's about which tool is going to actually help me to do that the best. I Um, think, yeah, I think there's also a romanticize a romanticism from kind of perhaps our generation. I mean, I'm a bit older than you, but the, we're kind of seeking that slightly tactile thing that we feel like we've lost. Whereas the Anna Leibovitzes of this world are like, hell no, like digital is so much more convenient and quicker and <laughs> yeah. whatever. And I've spent all that time and they have this amazing archive. And I mean, what I miss is having a contact sheet and that kind of tactile nature of shooting film. So I do, I do, I do still shoot it for myself partly for that reason to keep like a different method of recording a situation and a kind of a diary, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I wish that I would have come, you know, into this industry during the age of contact sheets. And I know, I know photographers will still make them for fun and, you know, like, and some people might, in some agency situations, they probably still use, you know, if they're looking at a bunch of images, like that's how they look at them. But like, you know, that used to be a thing that you had to do. Like, that's how you saw all your images in, in one place. And now I just, you know, pull up Photo Mechanic and I just freaking zoom through that thing. And I'm just looking mm. for keepers. And, you know, and I just, I kind of just, I wonder if, you know, if I have the relationship with my images that I could. Because um, I'm, I'm so quick to just like delete the bad, keep the good. Mm. Um, so I don't know, man. Maybe there's a maybe there's a way that I can start using some sort of contact sheet, uh, idea, you know, to where like, I'm actually taking more time with my images and looking through them and shooting yeah. less. I think that's, you know, I think that's what all people usually say film helps them do is film helps you shoot less. Um, well, I think also the other thing is that film limits your options of what you actually have. And therefore you instill a different feeling or emotion onto the final images you could take, you know, a roll of 120, so 12 images. And I mean, for me, that would be rare on a job to even get through a roll because I'd be shooting it predominantly digitally. But within that, you're probably going to find something that really kind of like you start to get attached to emotionally. Yeah. Think about 12 digital shots and whether or not you'd have the same effect. You just wouldn't because you've got so much more to choose from. And actually limiting your choice is, I mean, it's the same mindset as the art world. It's like people want something because there's only 12 of them out there. Um, You know, they want that limited edition print or they want this thing because they, because they're not inundated, but it goes so at odds with society, which is all about producing as much stuff and people consuming as much stuff. And that's, 
and film is kind of like when you shoot film it's it's the antithesis of that it's about limiting yourself and about slowing down as you said and about making conscious decisions but there's also a slight kind of psychological thing i think at play where you start to say actually this picture is really good but if it was digital you might not think it was that good but because it's on film it's limited and you haven't got much choice and it's almost yeah. like you i don't know you um it's hard to explain but i just feel like you uh you perceive more value in that yeah yeah and like you can take that negative and you can put it in an archival bin and you can come back to it in years to come and you can scan it and like i mean there's just there's more of a sense of like the tangible nature of film that i think is just well, been really I think helpful. with digital, we've lost a little bit of the um, sense of uh, magic. You know, like I remember years ago reading a introduction to a photographer's book, and I can't remember what the, who the photographer was, but they talked about this this concept of every uh, if you added up every photograph in the book, it would amount to less than a second of time. And the pictures were from a 20 year span of his life. Hmm. So this was a guy who was editing down 20 years of his life to the amount of time it takes to do a slow clap. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that was like, wow, each of these images represents something so minute, such a sliver of time. Hmm. And I guess with film there's this sense still of this magic of capturing something capturing light and putting it in a box to preserve it of this moment and why you chose this moment over that moment why this moment is important why you chose to show it with digital we're kind of losing that because you can have any moment you want because you can literally be there going right. and soon enough it will be like the shutter won't even be going it will just be left open and you'll be taking grabs yeah. So we're losing that sense of deliberate choice of the artist, in inverted commas, a photographer, who's saying, I'm choosing that, to show you this moment. I'm curating my 20 years of life into less than a second of time. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a choice, and that is, that is powerful. Yeah. And with digital, we're kind of losing that a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So, so real quick before I, uh, I let you go, tell me about, you've been making knives. Uh, spoons. Spoons, excuse me. You've been, making been using spoons. knives to make spoons. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'd love so to me, make knives, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have a forge that. in my back garden though, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me about this. You've been making, so what are these, what kind of. So uh, basically kind of like with, uh, I mean, we, we haven't really talked about it much, but obviously with the pandemic, um, I, I kind of had maybe one last job on the day before lockdown and then i've pretty much been following i won't been into the studio to pick up my kit and bring it all back home and be able to work from home but i haven't been uh shooting so i decided to to use the time i've been doing um a podcast this new podcast called the um, exposed negative which will be launching next week actually Sweet. i've been doing some youtube walkthroughs of my kit because people were asking on Instagram for me to kind of do that. And I mean, I, I'm no natural YouTuber, so they're quite, they're probably quite dry, but they're very thorough. Um, they're good. They're really I good. think, I think there's some good information in there. Um, and the other thing I've been doing, I mean, I'm spending a lot of time working. I mean, I'm really, I really enjoy woodworking. I really enjoy DIY. I really enjoy making stuff with my hands. And so I've kind of, um, the day before lockdown, my last job, I was photographing a neurosurgeon who was in his 70s, who was potentially about to be recalled to go back into hospital to help fight um, or to help work on the front lines. And um, he's an amazing guy. He'd been featured like in the New York Times before he's written books. He's been photographed by Paolo Peregrin of Magnum for, for an article in the New York times. I think that was, um, he's, he's got an amazing photography book collection and I was having to do all this at this kind of social distancing level. I carted all my kit into his house. He lives kind of 20 minutes away from me in Wimbledon. I, um, I then 
I'd said to him, listen, in respect of not touching any of your things, I'm going to shoot the portraits in the garden. So I took all my lighting kit, all my backdrops and set up in his garden. <clears throat> and anyway, we got chatting, really interesting guy, keeps his own bees. And at the back end of his garden, he had his own amazing woodshed. And I said, oh, I've, you know, I've just started um, uh, carving spoons. And he was, and he was, oh, really, you know, what, what wood are you using? And I said, oh, well, I, you know, I, I, I've got bits and bobs around in my, in my wood pile, but nothing particularly exciting. I'd really like to get some cherry wood. And he said, oh, well, I've happened to have some. I've got some. You can have it. So not only did I walk away from that job with a pot of his homemade honey, um, I also walked away with two lovely bits of cherry wood and he said, please, you know, email me a picture of the, of it when you finished. Wow. So it's still not finished. I've, I've done, I did one, um, at the beginning of lockdown in beach, which took forever to do. Um, cause it's such a hard wood and it's so, it was so seasoned that like, you're yeah. literally like chipping away at this thing. And now I'm kind of halfway through this cherry wood one. The weather's not been great because what I do is I tend to sit on the porch of my, I've got like a kind of shed slash cabin um, and it's got like a covered veranda. So I tend to sit on that and, and carve out there in the evenings when the, when it's nice weather, yeah, but because it's yeah. not been great, I've, um, I've not, I've not carved for about a week. So um, tell me, tell me this, what kind of music, what kind of books, what do you, what kind of things do you absorb and take? I'm a, I'm a big, I'm an avid reader. Um, I love reading books. It's one of life's many joys. Um, I especially love reading books when I'm traveling that are set where I am. Yeah, That's my favorite thing. Um, like a really good kind of Graham Greene novel. Like, you know, I remember reading Our Man in Havana when I was in Cuba and I've read lots of his other books, you know, like um, that are set in Sierra Leone or... Uh, you know, Kenya, when I've been in those countries. Um, I, so I love reading. I have quite a big photography book collection. Um, it's kind of got out of hand. Um, in terms of music, I guess, you know, I grew up skateboarding and stuff in the late 90s. So I was really into my Pearl Jam and my... Dude, no way. Uh, I was quite I love, into my... I love Pearl Jam, dude. Yeah, so I was into a lot of that. I was into a lot of... Um, I was into, uh, you know, had my Rage Against the Machine stage. I had, yeah. you know, the Angry stage. Um, and now, I mean, I listen to all sorts. I listen to, uh, it depends. If I'm working, I love putting on like um, something like the uh, public service broadcasting, which is a UK-based band. They use a lot of um, found uh, audio that's from like the old BBC archives. And they'll nice. mix it and they'll do themed albums. So they did, um, it sounds mad and a bit weird, but they did an entire album about the decline of mining in Wales. <laughs> and it wow. used loads of amazing audio. And it's fantastic because it's like, yeah, I can't really explain it, but go listen to it. Go find it. It's um, they're called Public Service Broadcasting. They did an entire album on space and it's got like the JFK kind of speeches about going into space um and you know the spaceway race between the us and the ussr at the time and it's amazing really good album um so yeah i it, it really depends music wise what kind of mood i'm in but i'm, pr I'm pretty eclectic to be honest yeah um, well, um i listen to a lot of podcasts i mean i love yeah i love being able to multitask with that kind of stuff yeah it's it's funny i i owe my music tastes uh primarily to my mom um, I, I, I was born in 93 and so like I'm seven years old when 2000 rolls around. And, uh, so I'm not really a nineties kid as much as I am an early two thousands kid, but because of my mom being such like a, like a rock, rock and roll lover, man, dude, I was like inundated with like Pearl Jam, Collective Soul, like all these like amazing nineties grunge bands that were just like. Like my wife, like didn't know before she met me. Wow. We were born, we were born in the same year, yeah. and it's like when I when I like turn on like Yellow Lead Better or something, or I play it on the guitar. I, I just like uh, and I or I or we'll be like out shopping, and I'll hear I'll hear it come on the radio, and I'm like, oh yes, like so whatever you're thinking about buying, it was meant to be because yeah, 
song is literally like one of my favorite songs ever. Um, it's funny because I feel like the music of your youth I, really has such a profound effect. And I'm similar to you in the sense that I got a lot of my musical influences, even though I would have hated to admit it when I was that age, from my dad. So I was listening to a lot of Led Zepp and a lot of yeah. Fleetwood Mac and kind of all these kind of 70s kind of rock bands as well. And then I've got an older brother, so I was kind of getting his influence, listening to a lot of Nirvana, the kind of, you know, the Unplugged in New York album. I just like that takes me straight back to kind of yeah. – beach parties in the summer and kind of yeah it's amazing how much you associate and i do i don't know if it if i have that level of association with music as much anymore but i think it's probably because when you're younger you're experiencing so many things for the first time that they're so much more poignant yeah. and you have such stronger memories of them and obviously the way the mind works is it only really creates new memories for stuff that you haven't experienced before if you've done something before it kind of short it kind of shortcuts mm -hmm. which is why for me kind of traveling is so important because it forces your brain to kind of be creating these new memories and it feels like time is drawn out yeah. but um equally the flip side of that is you then become a bit spoiled and i find it difficult if i get sent back on assignment to a country that i've already shot in I find it harder to get inspired the second time around sometimes. Wow. Man, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Uh, well, man, look, I could go on for hours and hours talking about um, these kinds of things. And I still have like a list of questions that I wanted to hit, but. Um, have you got anything quick fire you want to go through? Or Yeah. Talk to me about post-processing. Talk to me about your ideas of, um, you know, you, you get your, you get your pictures rolled up. Tell me about kind of your, your, um, your idea of editing. Okay. Um, processing. I mean, the less time I have to spend doing it, the better. <laughs> That's my idea of editing. Um, yeah. I like you, I tend to use Fenner mechanic if I'm on assignment and I've got a lot of images that I'm bringing in. So I might do my captioning and rating through that. Um, and then it's capture one all the way from there for me. I very rarely go into Photoshop. Yeah. Um, I love capture one. I don't, I don't do a lot of retouching like generally on my images. Um, I kind of, I just don't have the patience to do retouching. I can retouch. I have retouched on commercial jobs, but I, for myself, for editorial, I don't tend to do it that much. I'm very much of the kind of feeling if, if it works, it works, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I have, um, I use a, archive system that's kind of raid five i have all of my images archived all the way back from 2003 when i started shooting digitally um and wow. yeah so that sits in a big it, i was using promise pegasus systems and now i've got um a lacy 72 big yeah. uh on order so that's arriving on monday i think and i, I will that. transfer my entire archive across to that i've got a lacy uh, i say lacy i don't know uh, I've got a, I've got the five big, it's a eight terabyte. And then I've got it backed up to a Synology, like RAID 10 system. And that, that's really, yeah. helpful. I, I've got a lot less, I actually don't keep raw files, um, unless like it feels necessary. Um, but after like a year or two, I'll, I'll go and delete, I'll keep the raw files of the photos that I delivered, but yeah. raw files that I've never delivered. And the client's like two or three years old. I don't keep. Um, you know, I just have reasons for that. It's just, I don't want it to pile up. On, on no, my, that's good, man. I mean, that's a good storage. discipline to have. I've, I've kept everything and it's insane. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and so if you, if you cut, if you said, if you could put like a magic spell on your hard drive and delete anything that I don't need, dude, your thing would be cut like more oh, yeah. than in half for sure. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I try not to keep everything just because it just, it gets a little out of hand. Like you said, uh, last question, talk to me about narrowing. Wow. This is a terrible quick fire question. Uh, listen, I'm gonna ask you this one. Uh, talk to me about how you feel about the way a lot of like Hollywood images look. So like that retouched, perfect skin, perfect, uh, like per perfection. Talk to mm. me about how you feel about that. Your, your quick take bullshit <laughs> um, no i mean it is what it is but 
it doesn't always do anything for me like the pit yeah. it, it, you can be as retouched and as clean as you want but if you're lacking something like, there's something magical in photography when you get it right there's an emotion there's a connection there's something and if it's got that and it's clean then that's great you know mm. and there are photographers that are fantastic photographers that are able to get both but um i don't know i mean it is what it is it's it's not it's not my cup of tea but it's what they want like yeah. photography is a wide you know a, a wide church a broad church there's there's room for everyone and every style um and you know i've I, I do shoot a lot of portraits um so i have been guilty of kind of lighting stuff to the nth degree yeah and i sometimes enjoy doing that because it's creatively it can be quite stimulating yeah um but i do feel like you've got to be careful i do find that when i overproduce shoots you lose something else you yeah. lose the connection yeah. And I, and I asked that question specifically to you because you're kind of in this, I don't know, like you, you kind of have those photographers in, mapped out in your, in your head already. Like, and so you think about like the Hollywood look, I think about guys like uh, Miller Mobley, for example, I know Miller's work really well cause he's actually from Alabama mm. and uh, which is right next to Mississippi. Uh, people usually skip over Mississippi and think we're Alabama anyway. Um, but, but, uh, so I'm really familiar and I love Miller's work, his work. He really does capture a sense of like emotion. And, um, but I've always wondered like how I'm not really sure how I feel about like sending images off and you send them to a retoucher and like, they make everything look airbrushed. And, yeah. uh, and so like, I've always wondered, you know, how to find that level. And I feel like you are kind of in a place to where you're capturing images on that level. Like, high profile people, but you're not treating them like they're, um, like they're fake. Like you're treating mm. them like they, like they, they have freckles and like they have skin spots and they have loose hairs and some things are distracting and you can take out for sure. Mm. But some things like if you take out, it's like, you may have just lost something that was important. And I, yeah. and I feel like for someone like you, I would, I would imagine that the pressure to, you know, I saw that you, uh, you, you photographed like CEO of, you know, one of the largest luxury fashion companies, for example. Mm. And uh, like we're talking, and you, I think you lit him with like hard light. Oh, um, yeah. And so it's well, like. He, he was pissing me off. <laughs> <laughs> what was he doing? He was, uh, no, he was, he was, he was all right. But it was one of those classic things where you're kind of made to feel like the, the, the shit on the bottom of someone's shoe because you're, you know. I'm not going to mention who the CEO was, obviously, but um, and it, it, it was probably nothing to do with me. It was probably the fact that they were incredibly busy and about to open a massive show. Um, and actually, the reason I lit him with hard light was not because of anything like I wanted him to look silly or anything. It was the situation. Um, if, if it's the one I think you're talking about, it's kind of like on a almost like a drawn background. Yeah, and uh, it just suited what I needed to to create i wanted it to look kind of i wanted it to kind of stop you in your tracks when you looked at it i mean that was for a newspaper as well and uh a newspaper we have here called the financial times which is a bit like the wall street journal um so there's a lot more creative freedom on those jobs to just shoot it how i want to shoot it and i just deliver the images and the and the picture editors trust me to just get the job done mm -hmm. and it's so you know editorial rates so you very rarely i had an assistant on that but sometimes you're just you're just on your own on those jobs anyway because it just isn't the budget for assistance yeah. especially in the uk like the uk kind of editorial market is so different to the us editorial market um it's so much smaller it's so much smaller budgets and everything um it's kind of embarrassing really um but the yeah those kind of jobs i just i try and react to like how I don't know. You gotta, you gotta. For me, I kind of want to light something how it needs to be lit, not just because it's like a recipe that I know works. And that does happen. Like you go on jobs and you kind of end up doing some, something in a certain way because you're like, well, I know it works. Yeah. But I'm always, I'm always wary of that. I always want to be kind of pushing out, and I always want to deliver something above and beyond to the client as well, something a bit right. different. Right. And, and um. I mean, a piece of advice actually that we got the other day when we were interviewing this chap for our podcast was, it was fantastic. You know, he said, you always have to leave something, 
you've always got to give the client the last choice. Mm -hmm. Like you have to give them the ability to be able to make the decision themselves. And it's not so much the same for editorial, but definitely in the commercial world, I've seen it. You know, you need to kind of, it's a bit like when film editors will deliberately put in a mistake so that when the client finds it and gets back to them about their amend, it's a quick fix. And the client feels like they've put had their input without wow. actually making some drastic change. Hmm. And he cited a picture editor for one of the Sunday Times who used to hold pictures back and would, when he was asked to submit, he would always kind of give them these images. And then just before the deadline, he would turn up with these extra images that he'd had all along, but he'd held back. Hmm. And it gave them the impression that he was incredibly diligent and hardworking. But equally, it normally swayed their their opinion on what they wanted to use yeah. because suddenly the sing was like an extra bonus. So I don't know. There's a lot of psychology in that. I don't tend to play into that too much because it takes up a lot of mental capacity. Yeah. And the way I see editorial jobs, I, I'm not too worried. I want to go and I want to be happy with what I get. I'm not that worried about what the client thinks. Mm -hmm. And I think... That's partly a uh, uh, defense mechanism and it's partly a kind of um, strategy for longevity. You know, I started shooting 13, 14 years ago and I've shot everything from champagne receptions, PR events to weddings to A-list celebrities to war zones to whatever. And people don't like that because they want to pigeonhole you. They want to be able to say right you're this photographer you're a that photographer and actually i've come to realize that being able to um shoot lots of different things um means that you kind of can weather certain storms when they come along yeah um and for me going back to what i was saying like the editorial side of things i want to be happy with what i get and i could produce an image and give it to the client and they could be over the moon with it but if I think it's crap, I'm not going to be happy. Right. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it sounds a bit arrogant. And I think what it it's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's coming from a place of real kind of uh, giving myself a hard time over what I produce and what I like and what I don't like and having yeah. high standards of what I expect to be able to get out of certain situations. And let's be honest, a lot of situations, a lot of times, you're not going to be matching or reaching those. If I was to ask to go back and look over a year's worth of images, I could probably pick out two or three that I would say, yeah, I'm happy with them. And I'll still be happy with them in three years, four years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's like the biggest struggle is like, you know, you're creating work and there's the side of it where, you, you know, you've got to pay bills, you know. And you've got to be able to put food on the table for your family, you know, or for yourself or whatever. And, but there's also the side of it to where you want to be happy with the photos that you're making and you're, you know, you're, you're giving to people and you're selling to people. And, and I think that's like the, that's the, the journey for every, you know, lifelong photographer that is successful is like, you kind of, you're transitioning from creating photos that you kind of hate and <laughs> that you kind of despise to photos that you actually love. And when you find that, when you find that, uh, sense of, um, uh, when those things line up to where you're creating images that you love and clients are hiring you for those photos, I feel like that's whenever that does a, that's a really, and you know, I don't, I don't really know what that's like at this point, to be honest, because a lot of the photos I get hired without people even knowing what kind of pictures I take sometimes, but but the other but, thing is like to enjoy the process isn't a bad thing. And actually, yeah. you know, when I was shooting, <clears throat> you know, uh, drinks receptions or whatever, that is not glamorous photography work in necessarily, but it doesn't need to be boring right. and it doesn't need to be irrelevant because you learn so much from those situations. You can still be learning. You can still be improving. You can still be kind of understanding the dynamics of people in, in groups and talking to people and being able to direct people or not direct people or stand back and you know you can I remember kind of spending years doing that kind of work and really honing or trying to hone um like well what can I take away from it because I'm not necessarily going to walk away from this with a picture that's going to be in my portfolio right. but that doesn't mean 
I can't still try to get something really different and interesting. And that's how I started learning to light, really, because I was shooting kind of lectures and stuff like that. And they were quite dull. And uh, I'm, I'm my, one of my first jobs was shooting kind of B2B, you know, business to business type of stuff for an insurance magazine. Every week I would get another job with another bald headed guy in his 50s in a suit in a really depressing office. Yeah. And I started to be like, well, how can I make this more interesting? Um, and so I'd turn up with all these little speed lights and start lighting the hell out of it, right. trying different things and like creating scenes where there were no scenes. And that was really fun at the time. I'm not going to look at any of those pictures ever again, probably, but right. the process was fun. And I still think you can, I still think you can kind of enjoy stuff, even if you're not creating stuff that you're necessarily happy with and on the other side of that i think it's it's worth remembering that because it becomes easy to beat yourself up if you feel like you're not producing images that are kind of like you know you're going to remember or going to be in your portfolio it doesn't mean it's a wasted time mm -hmm. because the process itself will still be teaching you something yeah. and will still be honing your skills yeah man that's so good this has been so helpful for me personally <laughs> and so I, I can't imagine it how much is going to help other people, man. Thank right. you so much, Greg, for jumping on this. You've been great. No worries, man. Well, thank you yeah. for showing an interest. I mean, it's been great to, I've been quite slow onto the whole kind of Instagram game and, you know, it's because of people like you kind of showing an interest and reaching out and asking questions. Um, it's actually been really good for me because it shows that there are people out there who are interested, but equally it's kind of makes me think about stuff that I wouldn't necessarily think about. So I appreciate yeah. that. And I appreciate yeah. you having me on. Yeah, man. Well, uh, obviously wish you the best during this, you know, crazy pandemic, you know, season. And, and I hope that it, you know, gives you a lot more time to focus on things that are, you know, also important. So, um, Likewise. Hey, where can, where can people find you if they want to follow your work? So, um, on my website, it's just gregfinell.com, which is, uh, for now is F U double N E double L. And I'm, uh, I'm, um, I, I'm not two G's. I'm a Greg. <laughs> um uh and the same for my instagram is just my name uh youtube i've got a few little instructional videos that have gone one went up today actually um so yeah and i'm also on twitter but instagram really is probably the the place to go yeah well uh man greg again i've enjoyed following you over the last year seeing all your studio work it's just been uh it's been really helpful for me you know not just to not just to see what other people are doing, but just to see like what you know what people are capable of doing. You know, so I appreciate you being willing to answer questions and uh, probably keep looking for those questions because <laughs> I always have them. Uh, cool. Anyway, thank you so much, man, and I'll hope to talk to you soon. All right, man. All right, stay safe. You've just listened to the Local Analog Podcast. Our goal of this podcast is to dive deep into the creative mind and heart to become better photographers in our skill and in our character. For more information, please go to our Instagram page at Local Analog. Thanks for listening. See you next time.